Okay, so this is part two of the lecture. Okay, we are still in the policies of the state. No? So the symbols of statehood, of course, we have the Philippine flag, okay, under the 1987 constitution, um, name of the country, national anthem, and the national seal. Okay, it's also provided in Article 16. Uh, section 2 of the Constitution. How about the policy of the state with respect to cultural minorities? Recognition and promotion of rights of indigenous cultural communities. Um, in fact, we have uh, um, the Congress have legislated a law protecting the ancestral lands no, of indigenous communities the application of principles of agrarian reform and stewardship to uh, indigenous communities and landless farmers. It's also provided in their Article 13, Section 65 of the Constitution. And we also have a, a statute for this, okay? The Agrarian Reform Program of the Philippines were in the limitation of the ownership of agricultural lands no? during the President Marcos regime under the presidential decree 75, okay, yung limitation sa ownership ng agricultural land was 7 hectares, but ngayon, it's only 5 hectares under RA 6557, okay, so if you own an agricultural land up to 10 hectares, then the 5 hectares, which is the excess, can be recovered by the government and the government will distribute it to the farmers. You know, that's the agrarian reform program or the CARP. We also have preservation and development of the culture, traditions, and institutions of indigenous communities. All right. So how about for science and technology? We have priority to education, Science and Technology, Arts, Culture, and Sports under Article 2, Section 17. Um, as a review, as I've said, this is considered one of the non self executing provisions because, as I've said, the legislative department must create a law you know, for the execution and for the proper implementation of the policy of the state with respect to education. Okay. Um, another thing that we need to discuss is the constitutional provision on transparency in matters of public concern. So first, the policy of full public disclosure of government transaction. Again, this is also one of the non-self-executing uh, non self -executing provisions. No? So we have the right ROI, the uh, right of information law. No? I, I believe it's still pending in Congress right now. So uh, for, for how many years we have not, you know, we have not legislated uh, a law. I don't know what's the reason, what's the spirit behind their hesitation or their skepticism in passing this law. No? But um, for PRRB, he, I, I believe, and as far as I can remember, he issued an executive order, no? But when I say executive order, it only binds the agencies and offices within the executive department. And it does not, of course, it does not uh, apply to the other two branches of government like legislative department and the judiciary. But as far as statute is concerned with respect to the full public disclosure of transactions, uh, I, I believe it's still pending. Okay. Second, the right to information on matters of public concern. Uh, that's one also. Third, access to the records and books of account uh, of the Congress. Okay. So, sir, how do we reconcile the data privacy law with the right to information on matters of public concern? First of all, the data privacy law applies even to private institutions. Okay, so this is the thing that you need to remember and you need to take note. Okay, this is very important when you study the Bill of Rights. Okay, 
we should understand the Bill of Rights as entitlements for the people. For what purpose? This is not for personal invocation, but this is for the purpose of protecting the rights against the possible abuses from the government. Okay, so you can only invoke the Bill of Rights against the violations committed by the state or its public officers. Okay, so when you think that your right is violated by your friend who is a private individual, who is a private citizen, then you have misapplied the provision of the Bill of Rights because Bill of Rights can only be used, can only be invoked against the abuses, against the acts of the state. It's uh, actually a set of rights which balances, okay, which balances the power of the people on the other hand who is considered to be the governed, okay, and the governing body which is the government. So in order to, to, to prevent possible abuses okay, in the implementation of their laws and policies, we have to apply the Bill of Rights because through the Bill of Rights, it's a form of protection on the part of the people, okay? as well as the writ of amparo, for example. Writ of amparo is actually uh, a protection from the abuses of the state when, for example, the crime of, uh, let's say, there's a threat against your security, your, your life, and your property, then you can uh, file a petition for it of Amparo to seek protection and refuge coming from the acts of the state, coming from the acts of the public officials. Okay. Third, the access to the records and books of account of the Congress. Okay. Fourth, submission of statement of asset, liabilities, and net worth. Okay, so this is also very important. In fact, this is one, or this is the major reason of the ouster of former Chief Justice Reno okay, for being uh, violative no, of for, for failure or her failure to submit. Uh, statement of asset liabilities and net worth during her stay as a professor at the University of the Philippines School of Law. Okay, so we also have to remember that, and later on I will discuss the case, and we will have a distinction about the co-waranto and impeachment. You now, what's the difference between these two? Tip. Access to information on foreign loans obtained or guaranteed by the government. Okay, so these are all constitutional provisions of which we are uh, entitled to know. Okay, to provide transparency in matters of public concern. Okay, so right of parents to rear their children. Okay. The natural and primary right and duty of parents in the rearing of the youth for civic efficiency and the development of moral character shall so receive the support of the government. No? In fact, under the doctrine of parents' patriae, in cases when the child has been left by his parents no? or she or she has no family at all, then the state will serve as the parent for the child under the doctrine of parents patria. Okay. So sample question. Three cities in Metro Manila passed ordinances that impose curfew on minors in their respective jurisdictions. Petitioners argue that the curfew ordinances are unconstitutional. No? So we na challenge nila ang constitutionality sa curfew. Okay because they deprive parents of their natural and primary right in rearing the youth without substantive due process. Is the petitioner's contention proper? That's the answer, no. While parents have the primary role in child rearing, it should be stressed that when, the, when actions concerning the child have a relation to the public welfare or the well-being of the child, the state may act to promote these legitimate interests, thus in cases in which harm 
the physical or mental health of the child or the public safety, peace, order, or welfare is demonstrated, this legitimate state interests may override the parents' qualified right to control the upbringing of their children. So our constitution itself provides the state is mandated to support parents in the exercise of these rights and duties. State authority is therefore not exclusive of, but rather complementary to parental supervision. So with respect to parental supervision, has the state has a complementary right. In fact, you know, all our rights found in the Constitution and, and in uh, particularly in the Bill of Rights, okay, it doesn't mean that we are being entitled to these rights, we are granted these rights, we can already exercise all this, we can freely exercise this. Again, let us take note that every right okay, has a limitation, okay? it is not unlimited. Okay? So in cases when your the exercise of your right already contravenes the right of the people, it already contravenes the security of the state, it already uh, concerns and affects the public safety, the peace and order of the state, of the community, then your individual rights okay, will be override or maybe override by the legitimate state interest. Okay? Legitimate state interest outweighs okay, individual right provided by the constitution. Okay. Again, it's complementary as far as wearing of the children and wearing of the youth. Okay. Now, let's talk about the familiar concepts you know, um, under Section 2 okay, of the 1987 Constitution. Okay. What do you mean by uh, incorporation clause? You know, I am sure that you have encountered these words when you study um, public international law. Okay? So the Philippines adopts the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land. Okay? So through this, we will be encountering these terms, not the doctrine of incorporation and the doctrine of transformation. So what's the difference between these two? Okay? So, doctrine of incorporation, generally accepted principles of international law form part of the law of the land or no legislative action is required to make them applicable in the country. And that's what you meant by the Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. No? It actually states for the incorporation or it is called the incorporation clause, meaning even if Okay. Even if the international law okay, has no enforcing law here in the Philippines or if we do not have any legislation similar to what the international law is saying, okay, Philippines is duty bound to adapt the generally accepted principles of international law. Okay. What are these examples? No? Inalienable rights, the right to vote. Okay, your uh, right to life, right to property. Okay, these are all inalienable rights. Okay, respect for human rights. Okay, so once the international law has ripened into a use cogens, okay, or when it is considered as a generally accepted principle of international law, even if okay. We do not have a specific law similar to that international law for as long as that law is a generally accepted principle, then that applies also in the Philippines. Okay. So what do you mean by generally accepted principles of international law? We have to remember that these generally accepted principles of international law must not contravene you know, the laws of the Philippines. Okay? So when we say it ripens into a use cogens, it has been accepted by the international community, by all the states or majority of the states in the international community 
have agreed to follow this one. Okay? These principles. On the other hand, doctrine of transformation, rules of international law are not per se binding upon the state, but must first be embodied in legislation enacted by the lawmaking body and so transformed into municipal law. Okay? So in contrast to doctrine of incorporation, the doctrine of transformation requires a binding law, a binding legislation. Bago mo i-apply, okay, under the doctrine of transformation, bago mo i-apply ang isang international law, dapat magawa kami na ng national law dito sa Pilipinas applying the international law. In the doctrine of incorporation, legislation is not required. For as long as the principle is a generally accepted one, then you can immediately apply that here in the Philippines without need of any legislative action as mandated and as pronounced by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution itself. Okay? In other, in other words, treaties become part of the law of the land through transformation pursuant to Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution, which provides that no treaty or international agreement shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds. That's why if we engage in a treaty or if we enter into a treaty against, uh, with, for example, a particular state, uh, example, the Visiting Forces Agreement between Philippine government and U.S. government, okay, it shall be concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. In other words, treaties or conventional international law uh, must go through a process prescribed by the Constitution for it to be transformed into municipal law. So without that uh, legislative action by the Congress, that treaty cannot be enforced here in the Philippines. No? So what's my basis for that? The case of pharmaceutical and healthcare versus health secretary Duque. Okay. On the other hand, generally accepted principles of international law by virtue of the incorporation clause, as I told you, um, form part of the laws of the land even if they do not derive from treaty obligations. So the classical formulation in international law sees those customary rules Atong mga customary rules sa international law accepted as binding result from the combination of what are the two elements? The established widespread and consistent practice on the part of states and a psychological take note element known as the opinion juris sive necessitates or opinion as to law or necessity. Implicit in the latter element is a belief that the practice in question is rendered obligatory by the existence of, of course, our rule of law requiring it. Okay? So that's the basic uh, distinction between the doctrine of transformation and the doctrine of transformation. Doctrine of incorporation, no need of legislative action. Doctrine of transformation, it requires legislative action, such as in treaty and executive agreements, no? Okay, so let's also discuss about the doctrine of auto-limitation. Well, sovereignty has traditionally been deemed absolute and all-encompassing on domestic level. It is, however, subject to restrictions and limitations voluntarily agreed to by the Philippines expressly or impliedly as a member of the family of nations. So uh, it actually talks about uh, our particip participation in a particular um, international organization. Because once you submit yourself to a particular statute or international organizations, you are likewise okay, surrendering some part or a parcel of your sovereignty. Because you have to follow, you, are, you have consented yourself to follow the principles, the aims and purposes in the ideas of the organization you are affiliated with. The sovereignty of a state, therefore, cannot in fact and in reality be considered absolute. Okay? So what are certain restrictions enter into the picture? We have first limitations imposed by the very nature of membership in the family of nations, and second limitations imposed by 
treaty stipulations. So that's why um, consent is a fundamental factor when you engage or when you enter into international organizations or when you enter into international politics. Okay? Consent is material because once you have consented yourself to submit to the jurisdiction of that international organization, you are likewise duty bound to follow what is deemed to, to, to follow with respect to the principles and their aims and purposes. Okay, So that's the reality in the international politics. Okay. So doctrine of limitation, again, is telling us that while sovereignty has traditionally been deemed absolute and all-encompassing, it can be subjected to restrictions and limitations for voluntary acts of the state in entering into international organizations or multilateral treaties. Okay? Having said that, it is also uh, important to talk about the principle of non-intervention. Okay? The United Nations has repeatedly clarified that states are strictly prohibited from intervening in the domestic affairs of other states, most famously in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, which prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of another state. Okay? The non-intervention principle, however, is not simply restricted to situations involving use of force, acts of aggression, or armed conflict. It has been further clarified by the International Court of Justice to include the concept that the state cannot intervene in a dictatorial way in the internal affairs of another state because what we have there is the sovereignty which must be respected at all times. Okay, so despite the fact that a member is a mem that a member state has been affiliated itself in a particular treaty or an organization, okay, the other member state does not have the power and the authority to interfere with the domestic affairs of that state. Okay? In fact, in the application of the jurisdiction of the ICJ and the ICC, okay, but always remember that ICJ is different also from ICC. Okay, although they are both international courts. Okay, so in the applica in applying the jurisdiction of these two international courts, it is important to exhaust all the remedies available in the national sphere or in the national uh, level. So if you have issues involving Philippines, it must or you must exhaust all the remedies available in the Philippine government, the, the, the function of the courts in the Philippine government before you proceed your case to ICC or to ICJ. Okay? In fact, in one case, uh, a Filipino lawyer filed a case before the International Criminal Court against the, against the President of the Philippines for violations, alleged violations of uh, human rights. Okay, crime against humanity. But what was the response of the initially? Huh? What was the, the response of the ICC? At that time, it was dismissed because they are very rigid with respect to exhausting the remedies within the Philippine government because it shows respect to the sovereignty of the state in determining its problems in solving its problems within its national sphere. Okay, so talking about ICJ and ICC, these two are different. Okay, ICJ is uh, one of the organs of the, the United Nations. Okay, while well, International Criminal Court was created by virtue of the Roman Statute, Rome Statute rather. Okay, it is an independent organ. It is not. Uh, affiliated or it is not part of the United Nations. Okay? It is funded by member states and they cater different issues 
within the international community. Okay? So we will talk about it later on, the details of the differences between these two courts uh, at a proper time. All right. So in the case of Democratic Republic of Congo versus Uganda, the court affirmed that the Nicaragua decision had made it clear that the principle of non-intervention prohibits a state to intervene directly or indirectly with or without armed force in support of the internal opposition within a state. Just like what happened to the invasion of Iraq by the United States, you know, despite the opposition, despite the refusal of the Security Council in giving consent to the United Nations, to the United States of America in invading Iraq, no, but still United States in indeed they invaded uh, the the country or the territory of Iraq at that time. Okay, but again it has been clarified in uh, the plethora of places cases. No, it has been affirmed no under international law that the principle of non-intervention is fundamental with respect to state-to-state -state relationship in international politics. So you do not have the right to intervene because we are a sovereign country. Okay. So we have internal issues or national issues here in the Philippines. Let us resolve that on our own. Okay. Because our courts are functional, our justice are justice is functional, so you are not supposed to intervene to us because in the first place this is a national concern of which we are responsible to resolve. Okay? So when will you go to international courts just like ICC? When you do not have any remedies available within your country, within the state, and that's the time you go to ICC or you go to ICG because their jurisdiction is of the last resort. Okay? You cannot go there immediately if you are you know, if you are frustrated against the government or what have you, you know, you must first exhaust the possible solutions available in your government. Okay? So, mandatory rendition of military services to defend the state. One cannot avoid compulsory military service by invoking one's religious convictions or by saying that it's a sick father and several brothers and sisters to support. So they come ka ingo na na pwede mo dili na sa kung atil sa gira, no? Kay I am fatherless, no? Ako yung mahal, ako yung inahan. I'm supporting my father, ah, my my sisters, my brothers, my younger brothers, no? You cannot do that, okay? The duty of the government to defend the state cannot be performed except through an army. To leave the organization of an army to the will of the citizens to be to make this duty to the government excusable should there be no sufficient men who volunteer to enlist therein. The right of the government to require compulsory military service is a consequence of its duty to defend the state and its receptacle with its duty to defend the life, liberty, and property of the citizen. That's the case of People versus Zosa in July, in, uh, July 1938. So in cases when wala na military na hurot na, for example, or uh, the number of our military officials uh, is no longer sufficient, then the state can compel you okay, to defend the Philippine territory. Okay, let's discuss this. Separation of church and state no? under Article 3. Section 5, no law shall be made respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed. No religious test shall be required for the exercise of civil or political rights. Separation of church and state actually is a two-way process, okay? The church has no right and authority to interfere with the purely secular matters or 
purely state concerned or state interests okay especially those concerning the problems of the state okay with the legal problems of the state on the other hand the state has no right to interfere with the affairs of the religious uh, congregations or the church okay however church can be limited okay if for example the exercise of this freedom of religion would compromise already the public security public order and public safety okay just like in the case of covid 19 okay so just to prevent the surge of the cases just to prevent uh, people from interacting with each other and to prevent the surge of uh, the number of cases for example no to so the state can somehow put a limitation on that exercise because there is a concern on public safety public health and public order right so if we go back to the spanish colonization at that time there was no separation of church and state because it is the church who collects the taxes it's the state it's the church rather who governs the people it's the church who legislate who punishes people whenever there is a violation of law at that time so at all there's no separation of church and state okay so right now okay under the present constitution just to re, just to prevent okay and to anticipate possible uh, conflicting views okay and inconsistencies with respect to principles between these two institutions this church and state should be separated okay So we have this concept of benevolent neutrality approach, which states that the wall of separation is meant to protect the church from the state. It believes that with respect to governmental actions, accommodation of religion may be allowed not to promote the government's favored form of religion, but to allow individuals and, me, and groups to exercise their religion without hindrance. In the case of Estrada versus Escritor, actually, this is a case when uh, there's a court, you know, court of law, and beside it, okay, there's a chapel, I think, used by the people for their uh, uh, religious exercise. Okay, So according to, according to the Supreme Court, it's allowed. You know? The people are free to to exercise their religious practices as long as it does not in, impinge or infringe rather the, the public order, the public safety, and public health. Okay? As long as it does not compromise the interests of the state, then the exercise of uh, uh, the exercise of your religious privilege is deemed valid and acceptable. Okay? So let's talk about separation of powers. You know? I'm sure you are, you are all familiar with this. You know? So in this um, chart, you know, I will just simplify everything for you. Okay. So we all know that we have three branches of government you know, because that's a recipe for a valid and binding constitution. You know? There must be constitution of government. Okay? And our government composes of three fundamental branches. First, executive under Article 7. You know, what's the duty of the executive department? It's where the president sits. It's where the vice president, the different heads of agencies, secretaries, the head of bureaus you know, of the government are seated. Okay, So their duty primarily is to implement the law. Okay, Kung may ginawa para the the Bayanihan law, for example, we heal as one act. You know? So 
that law or that legislation okay is materialized through the implementation of and by the executive department okay without execution coming from the executive department the legislation would be useless okay on the other hand under article 6 the constitution we have the legislative department okay what's the duty of the legislative department to make laws mag, mag legislate you know magbuhat og balaod okay so sila ang tigbuhat og batas okay so they ha also have the power of the purse okay meaning they prepare the appropriations okay they enact the appropriation the budget for the for the annual period of the state you know these are all um delineated in the appropriations law okay to be of course uh enacted and to be uh discussed by the members of the legislative department so their duty is to make laws to create laws for the country on the other hand judiciary department under article 8 of the constitution their purpose is to interpret the laws but interpretation is not actually the primary purpose of the, of the of the judicial department because the primary purpose of the judicial department is to apply the law because interpretation of laws takes place only when there is doubt when there is ambiguity okay when there is vagueness with respect to a particular provision of a law and that's the time we interpret but if the wordings of the law is clear categorical okay, and is of no doubt then there's no problem okay so wala tayo problema ana kung hindi sa vague and ambiguous okay so the primary duty of the judicial department is applying the law okay so what's an example of that okay what's an example uh let's say uh, a law which uh, punishes uh, violation against women and children okay that's the duty of the legislative department okay? so who executes this for example uh si miss a no bago si dikasal sa iyang husband si husband b wife a husband b okay so when for example um the husband abuses the wife you know the day after their wedding you no know? so in that case the wife can file or can sue the husband you no know, for ra 9262 violation against women so who will arrest the accused the husband it's the police okay and police is under the executive department they will implement the law Okay. And who will decide whether that person is guilty or not? It's the court. Okay. They will file the case dira sa ikulang. Mo file sila ang kaso against sa husband na abusing sa iyahang wife. Okay. And basically, they will apply the law. Kung saan ginagawa sa balaod. Kung saan iyahang corresponding penalty. Okay. Now, is judiciary allowed to legislate? Okay. Magbuhat sila trabaho sa legislative department? No. Because that would be a violation on the separation of powers doctrine. On the other hand, executive department, for example, the Gong cannot go to Ecoland and decide for a certain case there. No. He cannot do that because that's the duty of the judicial department and you cannot encroach the duty of another department and branch of government by virtue of the doctrine of separation of powers okay now by the rtc or any court when we say rtc the regional trial court or any court prohibit a com committee of the Senate, like the Blue Ribbon Committee, 
from requiring a person to appear before it when it's conducting an investigation in aid of legislation. Kaning in aid of legislation, ang example ano ito na sila, Secretary Duque, karoon, gina-invite sila to clarify on on the commission and audit um, results. Okay? Because uh, it appears that there is a uh, uh, there's a, a misuse of funding no, of the agency. So that's why the Senate will invite that person to clarify on those things. No? But, the, but the consequence of that Senate uh, Blue Ribbon Community will not necessarily result into you know, conviction or acquittal. No? It will just, of course, give the idea for the Senate to what laws to the legislate you know, from the facts that they have collected and it may also uh, lead to a filing of case before the courts of justice. Okay, but the, the investigation, the committee investigation in itself in aid of legislation does not in any way you know, uh, renders you guilty or innocent you know, after the session or after the hearing, okay? So may the RTC prohibit a committee from requiring a person to appear before it, okay? The answer is no, the RTC or any court may not do so because that would be violative of the principle of separation of powers, no? The principle essentially means that legislation belongs to Congress, execution to the executive, and settlement of legal controversies to the, to the judiciary. To whose, uh, which um, branch of government is uh, duty bound to conduct Blue Ribbon Committee? It's the legislative department. So if the judicial department, like the regional trial court, the RTC, will prohibit someone you know, for the conduct of this investigation in aid of legislation, then there is a clear okay, and manifest violation of the doctrine of separation of powers because each the government branch is prevented from invading the domain, the domain of the other branch. Okay? So that's the doctrine of separation of powers. No? Okay. Um, let's talk about the principle of blending of powers. Okay, what's this principle of blending of powers? It refers to an instance when powers are not confined exclusively within one department, but are assigned to or shared by several departments. So there are uh, duties of the government or duties of a particular branch of government, which is shared no, to other departments. So what are examples of blending of powers? First, power of appointment no, to, to whose office no, it is primarily, primarily um, assigned. Okay? So the power of appointment is lodged with the president, no, which can be exercised by each department and be rightfully exercised by uh, each department over its own administrative personnel. Let's say, um, PRRB appoints, um, let's say, uh, Mr. X, okay? So PRRB appoints Mr. X to be the Secretary of Justice, okay? Is it automatic? This is not automatic because that person appointed by the President has to undergo interview coming from what department? The legislative department. Okay, the the what's what we call that the the CA. Okay. What do you mean by CA? What do you mean by CA? The Commission on Appointments. Okay, just like the late Gina Lopez, for example, the uh supposed to be an appointee of PRRB, but it's not automatic because she has to face the Senate, the Commission on Appointments, okay, before she be accepted for 
deposition. What else? Uh, an example, the duty of the Judicial and Bar Council okay, for prospective uh, Chief Justice. You know? So if there are, if there, if there is, for example, position for Chief Justice, okay, and it's vacant, you know? so the Judicial and Bar Council can interview, can, can conduct interviews for the potential candidates and they can send recommendations to the president. Okay, so that's blending of powers. Another general appropriations law, president prepares the budget which serves as the basis of the bill adopted by the Congress. So it is prepared by the different agencies. No, pila in yung budget na pangayon. Okay. So tapos ihatag na nila sa kongreso. And then the Congress will set a hearing, no? Questioning you, no? Interrogating the different agencies. Bakit ganito ang budget niyo? Because we will uh, do this or program is this and that, etc., etc. Okay? So that's general appropriations law. Okay? And there is blending of powers. In the in the enactment of that law, right? How about the principle of checks and balances? Okay, it allows one department to resist encroachments upon its prerogatives or to rectify mistakes or excesses committed by the other departments. Okay, so they are checking also one another. If they have blending of powers, we have or we have. Uh, they have blended powers. Principle of checks and balances also okay, equates the authority between these three branches of government by checking one another. Okay, so the legislative, uh, what's the executive check? Okay, meaning the executive department will check the legislative and the judiciary. So executive department checks legislative department through its veto power. No? Nagawa ng batas si legislative department. Tapos sinabmit nila kay president for signature and for the approval. But they have the right to, for the executive department through the president has the right and power to veto okay? that law. Okay? But sir, what if uh, na veto ni president Wala na bang magawang iba si uh, legislative department? They have an option through an overriding power, no? Exercise of overriding power by the legislative department. Okay, so pwede nila ma-override ang veto ni president. But it requires uh, numerous number of votes or support coming from the members of the Senate also or the legislative department, okay? What else? How does executive department checks judiciary? Through its power of pardon. Okay. Let's say si Mr. X, okay, na convicted of murder. Tapos, di pardon sa ni executive, ni president. So, pwede siya maka gawa sa presukan. Okay. So, it checks the decision of the judicial department. So it may set aside, in effect, the judgment of the judiciary. What else? Also by power of appointment, no? power to appoint members of the judiciary. Okay, So it is lodged with in the power of the president to choose kung sino ang justice, kung sino ang kanyang i-appoint as associate justices of the Supreme Court. Okay, And the judicial bar Judicial and Bar Council will just submit a list of nominees to the president. All right. How about legislative check? It checks executive department through override power. No, it can override the veto of the president. Reject certain appointments made by the president. Okay. So just like the case of Gina Lopez. Okay. There was a rejection from the appointment of the president. Revoke the proclamation of martial law or suspension of the privileges of the writ of habeas corpus. 
Okay, so if the legislative department thinks that there's no need to continue the implementation or declaration of martial law, so we should stop. Okay, so they can actually do that. Impeachment, okay. Um, the late Chief Justice Corona, okay, who exercised the impeachment, it's the legislative department. But the complaint of impeachment, okay, it originates from the House of Representatives. Next, it determines the salaries of the, the president or vice president, okay, because it is fixed by law and uh, it's to be determined by law. Concur to or reject treaties the president may enter into. Okay, so if there are treaties you know, in contrast to executive agreements, kailangan ay two-third, you know, coming from the Senate. Judiciary, okay, it can revoke or amend the decisions by either enacting a new law, you know, amending the old law, giving it certain definition and interpretation different from the old. Again, the purpose of the judiciary is just to apply the law. Okay? And in cases when there's vagueness and uh, uh, when there is ambiguity or the, um, the terminologies are ambiguous, then it's time for the judicial department to interpret it. Okay? Uh, what else? Impeachment of SC members, okay? Just like what happened to CJ Corona. Third, define, prescribe, apportion, jurisdiction of lower courts, okay? Prescribe the qualifications of lower court judges, impeachment, determination of salaries of judges. So always remember that we only have a single constitutional court, okay? And it's the Supreme Court, okay? Other law, other courts like Court of Appeals, Court of Tax Appeals, and Bayan, Bayan, uh, Municipal Trial Court, Regional Trial Court, these are all created through statutes. But the Supreme Court is created by the Constitution itself. Okay. Doctrine of state immunity. What do you mean by this? No? Indiscriminate suits against the saint will impair its dignity and supposed infallibility. Okay, as Justice Holmes would say, you know, there can be no legal right against the authority, which makes the law on which the right depends. You know? So you cannot state, you cannot sue the state without its consent. You know? If it were otherwise, government service may be severely obstructed and public safety endangered because of the number of suits that the state has to defend against. You know? So you cannot sue the, the authority you know? because it's the state also which makes laws, which makes laws you know? and on which our right is dependent into. But of course, there is uh, there's in every general rule there's always an exception no? so there are two types of or two forms of consent we have express consent and implied consent express consent when the express consent of the state to be sued must be embodied in a duly enacted statute and may not be given by a mere council of the government as held in the case of republic versus purisima okay we also have implied consent Okay, this is when the state commences litigation. Uh, so, in other words, or in that case, it becomes vulnerable to a counterclaim. Letter B, when state enters into a business contract. Okay, so if you engage, for example, in a uh, uh, construction, if you engage in a construction company, let's say uh, company A, Construction company A, okay, will uh, finish, the, for example, the Bankerohan Bridge, the project of the government. So if, for instance, the government or the state does not pay its obligation, wa niya gibayran ang iyahang dapat nga bayaron sa construction company. So in that case, the construction company can sue the state, you know, because it enters into its proprietary 
nature for its proprietary capacity. It, it engages into private business, private contract, private transaction. Then you can see the state in that uh, case. But for example, when um, uh, the state acts within its governmental capacity, no, if it is the act of the state, really, no. So if it is within the governmental capacity of the state, then you cannot, you can never see the state. Okay, except when there is express consent to be sued. No? Sorry, what? What if meron kaming claim against the government, no? Nagpakita sila tapos wala nang ibayaran. Okay? Where do you file your claim? Do you file your claim before the commission on audit? Okay? That's why it's very difficult to uh, file a claim against the government because everything is appropriated, no? It's based on the appropriation law. So, you can only claim your your, you can only file a claim against the state, maybe before or after you know, the year, because it has to be in, included in the appropriation. Okay? So you cannot just collect from the state after a blink of an eye or after a month or after a week. But last unit sa utuin. Okay? So again, we the state enters in or acts within its governmental capacity. You can never sue the state, okay? Because the state cannot be sued as a general rule, but if it, in, it enters into a proprietary in, within its proprietary capacity, if it engages in a private transaction, then uh, in that case, there's an implied consent and you can file or you can sue the government. Okay. So, for example, Keanu Lazar filed an action directly in court against the government seeking payment for a parcel of land which the national government utilized for a road widening project. Okay. Though we have just compensation under Article 2, Section 9. Okay. Uh, section 9, just compensation. Can the government invoke the doctrine of non suability of the state? The answer is no. No, in this case, the state can be sued when the government expropriates property for public use without paying just compensation. It cannot invoke its immunity from suit. Otherwise, the right guaranteed in Section Nine, Article Three. Ah, oh, it's Article Three, pala. Constitution: The private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation will be rendered nugatory. So if your property is located uh, along the highway and the government will, uh, will, will, you know, expand the, or if there's road widening, no, tapos na ego ang yung property, then you will be entitled for just compensation. You can claim just compensation from the government kay nakuaan or nabawasan ng inyong property. Okay? Um, in one case also, um, I, I just forgot the title of the case, but there's one person who fell, no? Tagak sa sa kanal kay na text-text siya, no? Tapos kato di ay kay na-construction sa DPWH. Tapos ang kanal, wala di tabunan. So natagak ang uh, tao dito ah uh, and gabi iman sa tapos walay siga and the, the the guy was severely injured you know so in that case the the person can sue the state because there is negligence on the part of the state in you know uh in in protecting you know the safety of the people because the government the local government only allows you know or did not give any warning no? na merong kanal dyan. That's why uh, it causes the injury of the person. So in that case, um, the state may be sued. But one thing you should always remember is kung if the act of the state is in a governmental capacity, it cannot be sued. 
if the act of the state is within the proprietary or in a private or business transaction, then in that case, the government can definitely be sued. Okay, so I'm happy to announce that that's the end of the discussion for the preliminary period. God bless and thank you for listening.